Well, good morning once again. And I am Pastor Jason, the, the senior pastor here. And we are continuing our walk through the book of Acts. And we find ourselves this morning at chapter 12. And as I've been looking at this all week, praying over this passage and just continuing to, to dig into the depths of this passage, something that kept coming back to mind is, is this idea that it, that it seems that, that, that what is presented here for us and what most would uh, attribute to the miraculous deliverance of, of Peter is that there's, there's almost a, a little sense of humor in what's going on, right? As the fact that, that as these believers are praying for Peter, we will see that he shows up at the door and knocks on the door, and yet they are not willing to believe that he's actually been released. And as I, as I thought about that, I, I just kept considering the importance of a sense of humor. Do, do you believe that a sense of humor is important, or, or perhaps you don't? I would say that if you're going to serve as a missionary, that that should be something in your tool belt that you must bring with you overseas. Otherwise, it will not go well for you. Why? Because you will find very quickly that you're going to do something that is going to cause all sorts of laughter on the part of the people that you've come to serve. And in Papua New Guinea, that happened many times to us. To me in particular, as I started language study, culture study, and I'd go out with the guys, and I'd go hiking with them, either on a fishing trip or on some sort of hunting trip, and there's jungle vines everywhere, and inadvertently I'd slip and slide and get trapped in a ver- in, in, in this jungle vine and flop down on the ground, and you know what? Everybody does. Everybody knows that, that, that's, that that's Jason, because they never fall, and they all turn around, and then they laugh at me. And then as my language progressed and I actually started talking more, what would inevitably happen is I would say something wrong and and everybody would start laughing. This would even happen in church. And what I found is that, that you need to be able to laugh at yourself. You need to humble yourself and just say, okay, yes, yes. I get it. Please help me. I recognize that I'm new here or what have you. As I was considering this, I stumbled upon it this quote by by Mark Twain, who obviously is a a very famous author, who wrote Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and and, and this is what he writes that, that that I found quite alarming, actually. He says this, or he said this, the secret of humor itself is not joy, but sorrow. There is no humor in heaven. I I totally disagree. I believe that the Lord made us in his image and and, and, in the personalities that he's given us and the emotions that he's given us. He's he's also given us a a sense of humor. And I would say to a certain extent, as I look at Acts chapter 12 today, and as we unpack this verse by verse, we we will see that there there is something sort of shockingly funny in this account. And and while I would say that, that God isn't laughing at us, and, and while I would say that God is completely holy, completely righteous, completely different than, than you and I are, and so I would never say that he's mean-spirited in, in his humor or that he's vile or, or that he's sadistic, but yet there, there, there is some aspect to where, where he, he does display holy humor, and perhaps this is an account where some of that holy humor is displayed. If for nothing else, what we will see today is that this is shockingly refreshing to see how the power of God and the power of grace is so vividly displayed at a time where the believers actually don't even believe that it could happen. And in so many cases, I can relate. As I pray for something and and then I'm, I'm amazed as the Lord answers, as if this was too difficult for the Lord. And we're going to see this this morning. As we will see clearly when God answers prayer. So so turn with me to Acts chapter 12. And this morning we are going to look at verses 1 to 17. 
And follow along as I read out loud. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and... Put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we need your help. We need your your spirit to direct our thoughts to what you have for us this morning. We recognize that that we don't pray as much as we should. And even when we do pray, at times we, we lack faith to trust that you actually can handle whatever it is we're praying about. So build our faith this morning and allow us to truly grasp and glean the things that you have for us from your holy word regarding prayer, regarding your power, regarding your wonderful love and grace. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we are going to see today, even even though I I could say that Peter is the the main picture, of or main person of what is going on this morning, what we're going to see is is we're going to see that, that everything seems to be revolving around this group of believers, we, we could consider them kind of a, a home church that revolves around their praying. And in this, the Lord is going to give us four different glimpses in, into the prayer of this early church, four glimpses that will help encourage you and I and, and us as a body, how we are to church, how we are to pray as a church, how we are to pray as individuals. And the first thing that we see, that the first glimpse is, is quite simple. That they had a reason for prayer. A reason for prayer. And that, that's seen very clearly in, in the first four verses. Let's look at them again. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. 
also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So what do we see? We see that the Lord allows a situation, allows a situation in the life of Peter that gives the body reason to pray. And yet oftentimes we don't tend to look at these situations, these trials, these struggles that we come up against as a a wonderful opportunity to pray and to watch God work. And instead, we look at them as something that we can't wait to get through. And how does Luke start? He starts with depicting exactly what the setting is. What was happening in this time and and what he says at that time that Herod laid hands on on some who, who belonged to the church. What time is he talking about? No doubt he's he's referring to what we saw last week at at the end of chapter 11. That a famine had come. And this famine had come to Jerusalem. To these very people. And yet we see that the hardship that that they're enduring isn't just the famine. As now a new persecutor persecutor of Christ's church emerges on the scene. And this time, instead of being Saul, instead of being merely a Pharisee, or perhaps someone even more influential than that, we see it's Herod the king. There's there's nobody more political that's stronger, that has more of an influence, politically speaking, than the king. And and what we see is, is Herod, he changes everything. That up to this point, what we saw back in in Acts chapter 7 and with Stephen and how he was was murdered, how he was martyred, and how then Saul starts persecuting the church. Who gets spread? It's all these Hellenistic believers. And they get spread, but, but who's left alone, untouched, almost as if they have some sort of invisible force field around them? The apostles. The apostles are untouched, unscathed by the initial persecution that Saul starts. But we see all of that changed here with Herod. As Herod recognizes, okay, who I'm going to go after is I'm going to go after the big guys. I'm going to go after the leaders of the church. And perhaps in his mind, he thought that he would go after Peter, James, and John as they were the big three. But who is this, this man, Herod? Well, he's, he's known as Herod Agrippa I and his His grandfather is Herod the Great. And what's really known about him is is that he was considered to be Jewish. And so what he did is he used that Jewish connection as leverage in order to to make himself allied with the Jews. But he he didn't do this in order for spiritual means because because he had this big spiritual desire to follow Yahweh. He did this as a a way of making himself more politically correct and bringing more favor between himself and Rome. So what he would do is he'd he'd go to the temple. He'd read the the Torah. He'd open up the the scrolls. And he'd try to follow all the Jewish belief systems. And as he did that, he he recognized that Rome would be pleased. Why? Because the Jews were, were not causing any chaos, not causing any problems for him. And so then this escalates into this plan where then he starts going after members of the church, but that's not enough. He actually goes after who we see here first, James, the brother of John, meaning one of the sons of thunder. And we have to remember that that this was one of Peter's friends. This was one of Peter's associates. And, and what does King Herod do? He goes after him, he grabs him, and then he puts him to death with the sword. Many believe that means that, that, that he chopped off his head. But that's not enough for him as he sees the favorable response of the Jewish people to what he did. So then what does he do? He goes after Peter. And as he grabs Peter, he, his timing isn't very good. Because this happens right after Passover. And a week-long time called the, the Days of Unleavened Bread. And, and during this, this week-long gathering of the Jewish people, 
the, one, the two things that you couldn't do is you couldn't have a trial, and so then you couldn't sentence anyone. And so as a result, Herod is then forced to place Peter into, into custody. And that's exactly what we see him do. But what we see is, is he doesn't do it so, minimally. He no doubt has heard already about what happened to Peter earlier and how the Lord miraculously caused him to escape from, from jail, from prison. So what does he do? He has four squads of soldiers that contained four men in each and look after him, guard him. Some actually believe, some commentators believe that meant that there were 16 men looking after Peter. Most likely what it meant was that there were four soldiers swapping every three hours, making sure that nobody would fall asleep and they could do as, as good of a job as they possibly could looking after Peter, making sure that he was not going to escape. And yet in all of this, I think we also have to remember, what, what was Peter thinking? No doubt on the one side, he, he, he was personally grief-stricken, I would think. Why? Because one of his good friends, his, his business associate, as it says in, in, in the Gospels, that when Jesus calls Peter and James and John, that they were all part of a, a fishing business. And so on the one hand, Peter's upset because one of his good friends has, has been martyred, has been killed. The, the first apostle killed, actually, James. But then on the other hand, he's also recognizing what's, what's going on is this is right after Passover. And what happened at the last Passover? Where his Lord and Savior was crucified. But not only that, that was also where Peter denied Jesus three times. And so perhaps throughout all of this, Peter started formulating in his mind, okay, Lord, I am not going to do that again. No matter what the cost, I am going to stand true to you. And, and I believe that's what Peter's mindset is. Even though his, his situation is so hopeless, so helpless, so bleak, as it seems that there's no possible way for him to escape from a human perspective. And the church recognizes this. And as they gather together, what, what's going to be their response and, and that's what we see next, as this reason for prayer leads to this, a response of prayer. This isn't always the case. At least this isn't always the case in my life. Sometimes when the Lord places me in a, in a situation where prayer is so needful that that's not always my, my first response. My first response is to try to handle the situation myself. But we don't see that with, with this church. Look at verse 5. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. I know this is very simply put, but, but don't miss the significance of who they are praying to. They are praying to God. They're not praying to one another, trying to come up with some great plan on how they're going to be able to orchestrate things and somehow get Peter out of there. You know, some commentators actually believe that that. The light and everything else that we're going to see actually is speaking about some sort of group that came up with this wonderful idea of sneaking into the prison and stealing him. No, that isn't what happens. This is miraculous. This is the Lord. And they are praying to God. And that is who you and I should pray to. Not concerning ourselves with what everybody else is thinking, but recognizing that we are praying to God. That we are coming into his presence and that he can handle whatever situation he is allowed to come our way. But notice what else it says, that they were praying fervently. Generally, when, when you and I think of fervently, we, we think of eagerly. That, that, that they are doing this and they're eagerly praying, but, but in the Greek it's more than that. It has the idea of, of stretching out the hand. And it's the same word used for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22 where it says that he was praying more earnestly. And then it also goes on to, to say that literally he was falling on the ground while he was praying. I, I wonder if the idea here is that these believers were gathered and they weren't merely praying, but they were lifting up their hands 
asking the Lord to intervene on their behalf. Why? Because they had just lost one of their dearly loved leaders and they didn't want this to happen to Peter. And and so they pray fervently. They pray with their, their hands lifted, stretched out. But where did they learn to pray like this? Did did they go to some sort of prayer school? No, I believe they learned from the apostles themselves. They learned from Peter because this is what Peter did. This is how Peter handled situations. We we saw this earlier in Acts in chapter 4 with the paralyzed man when he was healed. And then John and Peter were were placed into where? The Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin put them through the trial, and then they said, okay, you can go, but you cannot speak any longer in this name. What happens? They, they go back to the believers, and what do they do? They pray for boldness to do that which they were just commanded not to do. And, and we see this again in chapter 5 when the apostles are released. This is where they had learned to pray like this. They had learned this from Peter. And in this, I, I believe this is all giving us the setting of what's going on. And really what we see is, is we see a, pa- a battle being waged. And on, on the one hand, on the one side, you, you have King Herod, who wields all the power and the strength of Rome, able to do just about anything he wanted to do. And on the other hand, you, you see this, this weak church that all they could do is pray. That's all that they could do. They certainly weren't going to storm the prison. And in this, it, it, it reminds me of a really the only boxing event that, I, that, that I've ever watched when I was in high school, a senior in, in 1987. And maybe you, you remember this. If not, you, you'll probably Google it later. Sugar Ray Leonard up against marvelous Marvin Hagler. Sugar Ray Leonard had, had had resigned from from fighting. He hadn't fought for five years. Hagler was up two weight divisions, so so he was a monster compared to Sugar Ray Leonard. But after five years, Sugar Ray Leonard said, sure, I'll I'll go ahead and fight him. And the odds were heavily sided towards Hagler, like seven to one, six to one. Nobody thought that Sugar Ray Leonard would even be able to stand toe-to-toe with Hagler for for more than three or four rounds. Do you know what happens? It goes 12 rounds. It goes all the way to the end. And at at that time, they they had to have the judge's decision. Well, the first two judges completely split. One goes for Sugar Ray Leonard. The other one goes to Hagler. So we're left with the third judge. And the third judge sides for Sugar Ray Leonard. And yes, many people cry, outcry, and they, they believe that Hagler probably should have won and this and that, and that, that, that's not my point. My point is, is that Sugar Ray, well, he was the underdog. This was not supposed to even go 12 rounds. This wasn't supposed to even come close to something like this. And in so many cases, I believe that's what the Lord is trying to encourage us in this, a reminder that, that even when everything is stacked against us, and it looks like there is no way out of a particular situation, remember who we have on our side. We have the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and and we will see that here oh so clear. I believe that that one of our problems, at least one of my problems, when it comes to praying, it isn't so much how to pray. I know how to pray. I've I've taught my kids from the time they were little, okay, you close your eyes. We're praying to the Lord. Hey, I don't want you to be distracted looking around and this and that. But but it's not so much how to pray as sometimes it's what to pray. We, we, We find ourselves in a situation where a dear loved one has cancer, and we're not certain exactly what to say for fear that that, that we might say something wrong that upsets the person that we're praying for, or if we're by ourselves, that that we'll actually push our will in front of the Lord's will. I I believe a, a good solution to this is when you don't know what to pray and you're struggling over what to pray, what words should be spoken, the first thing that, that you and I should do is, is we should ask the Lord what we should pray. 
we should ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what do you want me to pray for this particular person? Because I want to line up with whatever you're thinking and whatever is best for them. So please give me your heart, your mind in this, and and allow me to pray what you would have me pray. So please teach me. Reveal to me what you want me to pray for this person. And that happens as we listen carefully to the Lord in our times with him. And we can ask boldly, why? Because of Christ. And we can trust him completely because of his track record, because he has always been faithful. And we can also know with confidence and great hope that his answer to our prayer will always be a part of the tapestry of the great work that he's doing. And so we, we, we've seen that there definitely is a, an opportunity that arises for this church to, to come and to pray. And they're praying specifically, notice that in verse 5, they're not praying for just anybody. They are praying in particular for Peter. And this is something that you and I should do. We need to pray specifically for particular things when we're praying. But we see that that there's a point where our prayer stops and, and then we must wait upon the Lord as he will give an answer to prayer. The problem is, is that sometimes the answer God gives is not the answer that you and I wanted or that you and I even believe can happen is, is the case here. Look at verse 6. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, speaking of Peter, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. So notice Peter's circumstance. Remember, this had been a week-long stent in prison. An entire week of waiting and wondering what in the world the Lord was going to do. And now what happens, we see from from the words, use it. That very night, what is Peter recognizing? Peter must recognize that he's at death's door. That that he has no other options. And that there's no way that he's going to save himself. And yet in all of this, with those bleak circumstances, look at how Peter responds. He responds by sleeping. And and not just a small little sleep, but he's going to be so sleepy that, or sleeping so soundly that the angel's going to have to do something to wake him up. And then once he wakes up, he's going to be kind of comatose throughout the whole process of coming out of the prison. How could he sleep so well? How many of you could sleep like this when you're in a situation like that? Instead of worrying and fretting, how could he do this? Because he knew that God was in control. Because he had learned the lesson of trusting the Lord entirely. We know this because this is what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 7. He says this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He knew that the Lord has had his hand, his life in his hands, and he willingly trusted him with his entire life. And in the case of Herod, Herod was going to learn that you don't fight God and win. And notice in this that that I believe a good description isn't so much the escape of Peter as it is the deliverance of Peter. Why? Because Peter barely even keeps up with what the Lord is doing. Look at verses 7 to 11. Again, for me, this is almost comical. We're talking about a grown man that the Lord has used, and yet, yet look at this. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared. This is not what Peter thought was going to happen this night. I'm sure he didn't know. And a light shone in the cell. Just stop there. So when a light shines in a dark cell and you're asleep, what, you, what would you think should happen? You would get up. 
But, but Peter, he doesn't even, he's sleeping so soundly that he doesn't get up. And so what, a, the angel has to kind of kick him I don't, in the ribs? I don't know. And a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Not that the angel did that. The Lord did that to reveal to Peter, hey, I am saving you. I am delivering you. But Peter is so comatose that he needs help. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. Like, you really have to tell him that? And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you. So, so he got the sandals, but, but he still didn't have his outside cloak on yet. And he's just like, okay, we'll put that on. Oh, and yes, and follow me. Why? Because maybe Peter was just sitting there all dressed, not certain where to go from here. This, to me, remi- reminds me of telling a, a, a child in some sort of dangerous situation, hey, this is what we have to do. Why? Because th- they're just not following you. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Well, that makes sense because he saw a vision before. When they had passed the first and second guard, which would have been incredible just in that, that these guards didn't wake up, and that he'd already left the two guards that were chained next to him. Now he comes up to the other two guards, passes them, and then he comes up to this big gate that leads into the city which normally Peter would have been thinking, there's no way I can open that. And the Lord handles it by opening it himself, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. I believe there's some good lessons for you and I to learn here. As the Lord teaches us about prayer, what is the first thing that we see? That his deliverance came at the last possible moment, right? He's on death's door. It's looking like this is going to be the way that it's going to happen. He is going to stand before Herod, and he is going to lose his head. But the Lord says no. Think about this. This had been going on for a week. The Lord could have done this any other time before that. Why does he wait so long? I believe to build Peter's faith, to strengthen his resolve, and to allow him to have more and more confidence that the Lord will deliver, that he is in sure, steady, strong hands in the Lord. And perhaps also to encourage the church. To encourage them to keep praying and praying and praying. But I believe there's something else that you and I, we we need to grasp. What happened to Peter must also be understood in what happened to James, right? Why is that? They were both apostles. They're both critical leaders. And yet one, James, dies. He's beheaded. The other, Peter, dies is miraculously delivered. Why? Come on, Pastor Jason, tell me why. And and I'll give you the answer. I don't know. The Word of God doesn't tell us why. You you could reason, well, the Lord still had more to do with Peter, but, but you know what? Peter, he goes off of the grid after this. We're hardly gonna see Peter again. Once we once we get to to 17, it seems like Peter he runs off and hides somewhere. And we're not going to see him again until we get to chapter 15 in the Jerusalem Council. And there he, he plays a small part. So I don't know that you could say for certain, oh, well, the Lord still had so many more things in store for him. The reality is the Lord doesn't give us the answer all the times. Sometimes you are going to find yourself, maybe you already have, in a situation where your why question is not answered. Your why question is not answered. And what do we do in that case? Well, you do like Peter. And you trust him. And you say, I know that you are good. You have always been good. You are good now. You will always be good. And I can trust that. And I know that you are right in all that you do. And I can trust in that. And I can know that you do all things well, so I will trust you no matter what happens from here. I believe that Peter's miraculous 
deliverance also does a very neat thing in that, that it pictures our salvation. It pictures salvation so vividly. Why? Because Peter was in a completely hopeless, helpless, and in and, and a human perspective, a completely impossible situation. There was no way he could save himself. He was imprisoned. He was asleep. He was surrounded by guards. He was condemned to die. Just like you and I. Just like all of mankind. We are shackled by sin. We're captive to its power. And yet, like Peter, we're asleep. We don't even recognize the power that sin has upon us. And then what happens? Just as the Lord came to Peter and shined upon him, the Lord comes and he illuminates the spiritual darkness of our lives and allows us to see, oh my, yes, now I understand. I am shackled by sin to sin. I can't do anything but sin. I need your help. And he removes those shackles of sin that hold us. Why? So that we might be set free to follow him. And then the last thing that the Lord teaches us in this is he he gives us this. He gives us a a final glimpse of the prayer that, that reveals that God answers even an unbelieving prayer. As I believe that is the case in In 12 to 16, look at what it says there. And when he, Peter, realized this, that he was out of prison, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate. Oops. But ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. Peter, but Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. So picture this. Peter gets out of prison. He knows that soldiers are going to be looking for him soon. But instead of leaving, running someplace and hiding, and getting out of Dodge, what does he do? He goes to the believers. Why? Because he wants to share the blessing that God had just done for him. He wants to share some of this, what we call in our community group, fresh bread with the body. And so that's what he does. He goes there. He knocks on the door. No doubt they're praying, which is just crazy. They're praying, oh, please, Lord, save Peter. Rescue Peter. Deliver Peter. Knock, 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 knock. Deliver Peter. Please, Lord, knock, knock, knock. Hey, would somebody answer that? They send Rhoda. She she goes. She doesn't even have to see him. She just hears his voice because he must have come to this church quite often. And she gets so excited over the Lord answering their prayer that she runs in and tells everybody. But what's their response? You are crazy. And then she keeps going, and she's like, no, I'm not crazy. He's at the door. Come on, you guys, believe me. And then they say, okay, okay. If it was anything, it was his guardian angel. And they actually believed in guardian angels at this time, which could speak of that if they believed it's his guardian angel, some believe that meant that he must have died. And that after somebody dies, right after that time, their guardian angel kind of roams around before they go up to heaven. So maybe they were actually already conceding in their minds that he was dead. Pure speculation. What they do is they keep arguing with her. Do you notice it's not Rhoda that convinces them? Look at 16. But Peter keeps knocking. At some point, maybe Rhoda got smart and she just said, okay, everybody quiet. If that's a guardian angel, what's up? Right? Let's go see who this is. And so then they go and they open the door and then it's Peter and then they just rejoice over what the Lord has done. They rejoice so much that they don't stop talking about it. And so what does Peter do? He has to shh. Why? Because at any moment, Peter's thinking the guards are going to show up and take me back to prison. Look at 17, and we'll close with this. God's grace is so amazing. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of, out of the prison. Why? Because he didn't want anybody to steal the Lord's wonderful work. 
to steal the glory that belonged to the Lord because no doubt they're going to come up with some other reason why Peter escaped. And so he's letting them know, hey, this is what happened. This is what the Lord did. And I want you to take this and I want you to tell who? And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. And then he left and went to another place, no doubt to hide out. This James is not the James that was beheaded earlier in the chapter. This is the the oldest brother of Jesus who becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Why? Because Peter can no longer be the ruler in the church in Jerusalem. James is gone already and, and, and John doesn't. Who takes over? James. This James. But notice in all of this that for all the things that they were doing right, they were praying to God which is what we should do, not to one another. They, they were praying together as a corporate body. This is what a believing body, this is what a church should do. That's what they were doing. They were praying earnestly. Recognize what time this was. This is in the middle of the night. And if Peter hadn't showed up, I'll, I'll bet they would have continued praying all through the night. And they were praying specifically for Peter. All the things that we should do as believers, as a body gathering, But the one thing that they weren't doing was they they weren't actually believing that God could answer their prayers. And yet in spite of that, the Lord answers their prayer. The Lord sends an angel. The Lord drops his chains. The Lord lifts the gate. The Lord rescues him and then brings him to them so that they can rejoice. Is that not God's grace? And that should be such an encouragement to you and I. Why? Because if God would still answer their prayers when they were not believing him, then when, you and, when, when, when I do the same thing, when you do the same thing, you know what? He can still answer our prayers, even when our faith is weak. Why? Because he is so full of grace. So some things to consider. Some points to ponder this week. Consider how the church in Jerusalem was praying for Peter all night long. How do these verses encourage you to pray more eagerly? Number two, consider how the church in Jerusalem did not believe God had answered their prayers and released Peter. And yet the Lord saw fit to answer their prayers anyways. How do these verses encourage you to watch for answered prayer? How many times do we miss the Lord's answer? not even knowing that he answered. We miss it because we're expecting him to answer like this, and instead he answers like this. And that there's somebody knocking, but we're coming up with every excuse as to why that that is not the answer, when that is the answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, do, we do bask in your wonderful grace this morning. We thank you for, for this vivid picture of how we were shackled in sin and how you came and you delivered us, you saved us. We thank you for for the reminder that you do indeed answer prayer and you're not even limited when we lack faith. Lord, we ask that you would grow our faith and that you would allow us to walk before you humbly, seeking your will, seeking your face, and that you would cause us to pray more as a body, more as believers, for your glory. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.